I am thrilled to bring back to the show Renee from Fallacy Alarm. And if you want to follow Renee, and you should, and you should be getting his newsletter, you go to fallacyalarm.com and you can read his blogs and and you can even sign up to uh, get into the deeper stuff that he talks about. But in particular, you want to get his newsletter because that'll keep you informed of what his really, you know, Brian Wong comes on the show and he does stuff in science that is above my pay grade. Renee, thank you for coming on my show and talking to me about things in finance that are above my pay, my pay grade. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad to be here. Thank you, Randy. All right. This is Randy Kirk, in case you didn't figure that out and you want to like and subscribe. You know, when you hit the like button on this one, it says bring Renee back. That's what I'm looking for you to say. All right. And then uh, subscribe and notify. Lots of amazing shows coming up in the future. Uh, and then, of course, join my Patreon and you get the free book. All right. Renee, let's jump right into it. Uh, you had sent out an email a few weeks back and I immediately responded to you and I said, oh my gosh, I never thought about this at all. And it's so cool. And it's all about commitment and commitment in, in terms of the, 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 uh, the investor. But it was not like I'm so committed to Tesla stock. It was like a different kind of, well, anyway, it was so intriguing. I said, you got to come on. You put me off for a while because you said, I need to go, I need to do this a little better. I need to do it a little more uh, organized. And I said, okay, okay. And now you're telling me, okay, I've got it. So Renee, what do you mean when you talk about investor commitment? Yeah, it's called um, the Commitment of Traders Report. Um, that's published by the CFTC. Um, that's the governing body for all the derivatives exchanges on, um, on US soil, basically. And um, yeah, they publish how much of futures and options positions are out there. And I think that's an important signal um, because it informs us about um, how much leverage is in the system and where the crowd is currently going. And I think that can be very important um, to monitor. So yeah, I'm covering that regularly. So I see. So I do see some people that call themselves technical traders who will go in specifically on Tesla stock and they will are Tesla options and they will point to certain options points as examples of where there seems to be a lot of uh, trading going on, which indicates maybe a top or a bottom. Is this more of a general case of that that you're talking about? Yeah, so I'm, I'm not too much into like chart analysis. Um, I feel like I don't have an edge in that, um, in that field, um, but I think positioning in general is important. Um, it's just, it's one um, aspect of many that helps me inform an opinion on, on what I think markets will do. Okay. All right. So then, uh, so, and how do, how do we take a look at this? What, what, what is the way for uh, an average guy like me to be able to look at what's going, what these indices are or whatever, and, and use it as part of what we do? Yeah. So before we go into like looking at the actual charts, I think it makes sense to, um, look into the basics a little bit. Okay. So I um, I brought a few um, charts here from um, um, from my research that I published. Um, yeah, so, so this is from the articles that I've written, just summarized it here so far, so it's better visualized for, um, for a video. So you should see a slide here now. Yes, Please? I see. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so um, let's start at, at the beginning. So um, imagine for a moment there is no derivative out there, right? So if you want to buy, or if you want an exposure to an asset, um, you buy by, it. By, by the way, by the way, just for uh, clarity, by derivatives, you are talking about all calls, puts, other. Yeah. Okay. All right. So a derivative is an, a financial instrument that has a price that is a function of an underlying, and that's mostly um, options, calls, puts, and futures. Okay. All right. Yeah. And if there was none of that, right? You 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 want exposure to an asset, you buy it. Um, if you don't want exposure to an asset or you want to even short it, you sell it, right? And then the balance between buyers and sellers every day determines the price. Um, and th that's simple and everyone, everyone understands that. And now um, options um, enter the game. And the question then is, um, how likely is it that there's always exactly the same number of, put, uh, of call, put, um, buyers and sellers? And for every strike, for every maturity, right? I think it's impossible. And that's where then market makers enter the stage. They provide liquidity by basically being the counterparty to every trade. Like 99% of the trades out there, the market maker is the counterparty. 
And so is so so isn't this also kind of true for stocks themselves? Is it aren't there market makers who uh, at least when the IPO is issued, there's market makers who are providing that kind of uh, trading environment? Exactly. It's true for stocks as well. Uh, but I think it has another dimension in the derivatives market because when a market maker um, in a stock, for example, uh, buys and sells, they can run always a book and they can then, um, if, if they have too much long exposure, for example, they can change the quotes a little bit to, to reduce that again. So it's it's fairly simple for them to manage their book. And and for options, it's not so simple. And so, that, so again, um, let me yeah. let me let me make sure I understand that. So if I am a market maker in a stock and I am providing the liquidity at any given time because the, the there's not enough buyers, not enough sellers, and I don't really like that price point. If I feel like I'm exposed too much at that price point that I'm having to either buy or sell stock that I don't want to do at that particular time, I can cover myself with a derivative. Is that is that is that what you're saying? Um, no, I I, um, I want to go the other way. Um, it, it can play a role, I guess, because a market maker will engage in all kinds of financial instruments and run their book. Um, but I want to focus more on the options and and um, um, what the mechanics are there. I okay, so it's, so but yeah. what I, but, so then what I thought I heard you say though was that when you're talking about somebody making uh, being the market maker or having a book in the options side of it, they don't have this other place to go to cover their bet, so to speak. Yeah, that's where I'm at it. But I want to take a step back first. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, to make sure I get my point across. Um, okay. So they don't want any direction exposure, right, with, with the option um, trades. Um, and there are three ways for them to accomplish that. So first of all, they can just do delta hedging in the option chain. So they can, for example, buy a 0.5 delta call and then sell 2.25 delta calls with a different strike, different maturity and so on. And, as, and they, they have to hedge this dynamically. But as long as they do that well, and as long as markets are not completely um, out of whack, this will work pretty well for them. Um, and, the and, by Delta, and by Delta, we're talking about the amount that the that the derivative or the call or the put moves compared to the underlying commodity or the, the underlying uh, asset. Exactly. Yeah. So a 0.8 Delta call, for example, moves like 80 shares. Right? because one call contract is equivalent to 100 shares. So 0.8 is then 80 shares, and that would be a call that's, let's say, um, find the money, for example, right? Uh, compared to uh, one with like 0.1 Delta call that is far out of the money. Right, okay, so then you can, one of the methods that they can use is by buying things, buying more of or somehow hedging by using a Delta that's uh, in, at a different level. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Right. And, and they can do that to a certain point, but at some point they they have to do other um, they have to use other methods as, as well. Okay. And the second way for them to do that is they can manage implied volatility. So volatility um, in an option price makes it more expensive or less expensive. If there are a lot of call and put buyers flooding the option chain. They can simply quote higher option prices to repel them a little bit and and reduce this desire to buy calls and puts because then people for example say oh that's too expensive i don't want to buy them so that's another way how they can manage the tides of of the option um, traders um, but both of these are usually not enough they need another valve to release the pressure and to get to zero direction exposure and that's when the connection to the stock happens that you um, mentioned was already when, when we spoke a minute ago. So they will start delta hedging in the actual underlying. Oh. Yeah. So for example, you, Randy Kirk, buy from them. Um, I think you mentioned last time we spoke like a 400 strike call for next year, right? Let's say you buy that. And let's say that has like a 0.5 delta. Then they are short that call. So then they want to get rid of the short exposure they have in the stock and they just buy 50 shares. I see. Right? Okay. So, and then I think it becomes obvious or should become obvious Then a long call is a leveraged bet on the underlying. And the market maker is the stock custodian. They, they hold the 50 shares that you bought with your call option in their own balance sheet, right? They are your stock custodian. 
Right. And the theta you pay them every day, the theta decay, that's the interest rate you pay them. Right. right? Let's again, let's explain that for those who are not really familiar with options is that the way that uh, an option works is that the closer you get to the actual date that it's going to expire and or that you have to take possession, either take possession or it expires, the closer you get to that date, the less valuable the option is in general. It may go up or down because of other reasons. The underlying asset goes up or down but it's also just going to continuously get worth less just because there's fewer days left for you to uh, take advantage of the opportunity. Exactly. That's exactly what theta is. And uh, every single day you have a bit of a headwind there, right? It trickles right. away. So yeah. it's like interest. And so it's, yeah. it's, the thing that it, it's the thing that causes you to go, <laughs> for me, when I'm trading leaps, uh, when I get under a year, I start looking for opportunities to sell that a particular call and then turn around and buy a longer call uh, because my theta, my my uh, my time is running out. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And and the theta is a function of leverage. The the more ambitious you you um, calibrate your trade, the more leverage you have. Let's say you buy a 600 strike call instead of a 400 strike call. You have more leverage, right? That, um, right. But you pay more interest because the theta decay is worse for you. And we always have to remind people that you have more leverage going up, but you have more leverage going down. So yeah. it's, so when you're the impact goes both ways and that's where people who trade leaps like me sometimes end up owning that leap and um, at zero. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Unfortunately, that's true. Um, and the interesting thing then is about all of this is the how many op, how many call buyers, call sellers, uh, put buyers, put sellers are out there that plays a role in the formation of the actual chart. And I want to show you two examples and they might look familiar to you. Right? Okay. So let's look at the left chart here. How does that look like to you? What could that be? What kind of asset? What kind of what? The, what what kind of stock do you think the left one is? Um, well, it looks like it looks like Tesla. <laughs> Um, no, I don't think so much about the about the um, the slope, but more about the pattern, like um, oh, sl slow slow um, appreciation and then Pass sharp declines. Oh, oh, and then sharp decline. Yeah. Oh, um, a recent example, Boeing. <laughs> um, so I I'm going to help you. This okay, is basically okay. the S and P, right? Oh, the S and P. Yeah. I see. Okay. So. And the interesting thing is in the S&P, the option trading is mostly the, the traders, they short calls because they want to produce income. It's a very attractive strategy for people to monetize their equity position. Okay. Um, and they buy long puts. I think about an insurance company, for example, they have insurance liabilities. They can't afford certain drawdowns, so they buy long puts. I see. And both of these cause the market maker to be short um in the underlying gotcha. and that causes these these gamma squeezes these negative gamma squeezes right i'm not saying this is the only reason that causes crashes like those that happened in let's say 2020 right um there are many other factors at play but this certainly helps to ignite that right it's okay. like this big general um yeah short volatility trade um in, in the market and and that then um yeah destroys um, a lot of market value very sharply, and then it slowly um, increases over time. I got it. Okay. And yep. so, if you look at the right one, how does that look like to you? Yeah, you're good. You're now, now you, now you've got me. I don't know what the. <laughs> you're, so, just gonna have to, you're just gonna have to tell me. <laughs> consolidation for a long period of time, and then sharp gamma squeezes up. Right. So think about this is here 2013, 2013, 2015, and then 2020. Boom. Oh, I see. Okay, so this so, is the short squeeze going on. So here. this is this is Tesla. Yeah. Right. So Tesla doesn't have this um, the same option traders because yeah, for the longest time it wasn't part, it wasn't a big part of institutional portfolios. So mostly the option traders were people like you, you and me. They bought leaps, maybe sold some short puts to buy the dip if possible, and the market makers are net long. 
And you might remember from three years ago when the whole S&P inclusion rally happened, how many people uh, were actually looking at these market makers and how much shares do they own? And is that part of the big S&P squeeze, right? That's exactly the case. Yes. Yeah. So the market makers are, were, I don't know right now, it's difficult to get the information, but the market makers, they own, they are long in the, in the share, in the, in yeah. the underlying, right? And, and so then it causes these gamma squeezes to the upside, not to the downside. And then Tesla consolidates over long periods of time until the next wave comes. Right? And, they, and repeat, wash, wash, rinse and repeat. And uh, no, nobody ever seems to learn. <laughs> we'll, we'll see how it goes, right? It can happen over time. Maybe Tesla will become more a um, um, a more traditional company now that's in the S&P and, and that earnings are more predictable. I don't know. We'll see. But uh, for now, it seems to be very similar. Like what happened in the past seems to be happening again. Okay, then uh, let's let's move to the futures then because they matter as well, not just the options. And then we can go into what the actual data says afterwards at the moment. Um, so with the future, it's, it's, it's basically the same thing, but it's simpler because there is no volatility or anything priced in the futures. A future is basically an agreement. Um, you and me, we decide that um, I buy S&P um, units from you in three months at a price we specify today, right? And there's no money that changes hands today. And um, again, it's not always the case that there are the exact same number of buyers and sellers of futures contracts. So again, there is a market maker and they need to get rid of the exposure, right? And so they will mirror each trade in the underlying. I see. And, okay. and then again, like you, you buy a future on the S&P, I'm the market maker selling you that. So I buy the S&P spot, right? Got and it. then again, the future is a leveraged bet on the underlying. The market maker is the stock custodian because I um, hold the shares for you. And then the future over spot premium is the interest rate because usually we agree on a price that's a bit higher. Right. Right. Got it. Um, so that's yep. simple. Like we, we can quickly move on from here. Just wanted to explain that futures and options have very similar characteristics right. from this perspective. Okay. And so then, um, and I, I mentioned that already before, um, the derivatives market is then a place where leverage happens, where leveraging processes and deleveraging processes happen. And obviously that is how bubbles and, and the bursting of bubbles happen. Can we, can, that, we can we back off, uh, back up for just a second uh, and see if, I, if my understanding of this part is correct. The derivatives markets, the futures markets were not designed in advance for people to be able to get leverage. They were not even designed in advance for people to be in the trading of derivatives. They were basically designed as insurance. Um, so the classic example would be somebody who needs, uh, is a farmer, uh, they sell their crop uh, in the futures market for the fall when the crop's gonna come in so that they have the cash to go and plant the seed now. And so somebody's giving them insurance that they're going to get at least this price in the fall, no matter what. And that person's betting that the prices will go up by the fall. And the farmer is betting that maybe the price might go down. Uh, similarly, I was in the plastics business and I needed to buy uh, train loads of plastics. And I didn't want to wait until six months from now and all of a sudden the price goes crazy. And now I don't know what to do in terms of how to charge my customers so I can buy those futures and know that my price on those plastics will be true for as far out as I want to buy the futures. So the reason, the underlying reason was not leveraging and deleveraging, but now there's a market. Now the market becomes something that people can use for leverage. Exactly. That's absolutely correct. That was how they came into existence. And then some smart financial engineers figured out that you can actually make a casino out of it. Right. I see. Okay. All right. There you go. And, uh, <laughs> Um, and, and that today can give us two signals, basically. Um, it can signal crowded trades that we might want to fade as investors, right? And But it can also signal inflection points when something turns and it shows, okay, that's where the tide is going. And that's something you want to follow, not fade, right? So it's important that there are two kind of contradicting um, interpretations that you can make from this. So let's, let's go back to... to 
crowded trades <laughs> to be faded. I'm sorry. Now you're talking. <laughs> sorry. Greek. You're talking okay. in Greek. What? what okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, well, crowded trade is. Let's say there is a certain um, sustainable level of leverage in the option chain um, that um, a market can, yeah, can sustain basically, right? That that investors can manage. Uh, uh, that is that provides them with volatility exposure that they can bear. So we're and so so, let's, so let's let's take a, a, an example. Let's go ahead and use Tesla. Everybody that's on this channel cares about Tesla. So Tesla is an extremely volatile stock. And because it's extremely volatile, you have more options exposure to Tesla than any other company in the world right now and has been for years. Um, and so people, when they're investing, not you and me, maybe, well, maybe you, but less me, when when people are investing in that more like a casino, uh, they are trying to take advantage of this volatility. And so the beta, the, the amount that this, uh, uh, under the, the the derivative, the call the put moves is going to going to be way higher compared to the underlying stock price than let's say somebody that's buying uh, Kroger. <laughs> is that yeah is that fair? Yeah, and, and the investors uh, that buy Tesla, they have a certain appetite for volatility, right? Or let's say an ability to bear volatility, right? And the more they they um, go from the stock into the option chain. The, the higher their volatility goes, right? If you have a Tesla stock, you have already very high volatility. If you buy a call, it's even, even more. Yes. And there is somewhere an equilibrium where people have an exposure that they can sustain, right? That that like there was something we tested that in January when the stock dropped to 100, people were tested. Okay, how much are you actually willing to bear? Boy, and, boy, there was a lot of people that couldn't bear it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and that was a big, like a very big deleveraging event in the stock, which is why I and I wrote about that in January. In January, I wrote this is a major bottom for Tesla because that deleveraging event event has flushed out every weekend possible. Right? Um, that was part of why I was so optimistic in January because there was a very major low that was marked back then. Right. right? Okay. And and so basically, there is there's a sustainable level of leverage. Uh, Volatility exposure, whatever you want to call it, that people can can bear. Mm -hmm. And if they if they if they become exuberant and they go above that level, then this has to mean revert to the sustainable level, right? And so if if um, if the long and you can make the same argument on the short side as well, but since we are we Tesla bulls, we want to talk about long exposure. If a long trade then becomes too crowded, if there are too many people with too much leverage in the system then that needs to be in reverse and to fade something in into it or whatever like in investing means that you you want to bet against that right I see. so I see. if if something is overextended you want to bet in, in the other direction because so, leverage cannot no. rise forever so so the, the so the let if you're not a financial genius you call this being out over your skis yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so the market is out over its skis on in a particular situation. Maybe it's at uh, trading at 410 uh, and everybody's saying this is impossible. This stock is not worth, you know, 410. And and, you know, and you're starting to hear tons and tons of, of uh, commentary that it's not worth that much. Uh, this might be a time to look at some kind of an options move, shorting the stock, for instance, as a way to bring down the the bring down the exuberance exactly yeah and then if the exuberance is really down by a lot to extreme levels in the other direction right and then you see that it ticks back in the other direction again that's what i mean by an inflection point it's actually not uh, an inflection yeah. point it's more like a turning point right yeah. inflection was not the right word that i used here um but basically that the the slope would say it's an inflection because the slope moves up and that's something you see okay there is optimism coming back and that's something that we want to exploit, maybe, right? Like, right, right. Not make financial advice here, but yeah. Um, and so everything that I've explained here, I actually made a big um, uh, Twitter. You cannot call it a tweet anymore; it's a post now, apparently. But, right, um, right. Yeah, you might, you maybe even want to put the link um, to this for your viewers into the description of the YouTube video, or they can just search it on Twitter or X. Um, so this explains everything I've said in the last half an hour. Um, yeah, for for those people who prefer to read. 
Yeah. Okay. All right. Or like, yeah. And, and let's look at then what is actually going on right now, knowing this, right? So this is the S and P 500 consolidated means it's all futures contracts, all options contracts at their Delta equivalents on the okay. S and P. And there are very, there are many, there are different, there's S and P futures, there are E mini futures, uh, there are micro futures uh, with like smaller sizes for people that want to uh, have smaller packages. So all of that together, and that's the net long exposure, right? And you can see that historically, this has very well um, foreshadowed uh, correction. So in February 2020, for example, you know, it was very high here. And here the mouse versus here, you see, very ex overextended here. And then it crashed down alongside the big COVID crash, right? And then the same thing happened here again in, in, late, in late 2021, early 2022. And then it came down well here, right? Um, but it, it's not a necessary or a sufficient condition for a crash, right? You can see that here in 2018, very high, very high. but it came down without a crash, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So at this point in time, could actually have been very bearish looking at this and get a false signal. Right. right. So right. I, I want to I wanna drive this point home that this is not something that's not a tradable signal. Yes. But it can be part of an overall analysis that gives you an opinion on the markets. And so, and we have seen that in, in um, um, earlier this year, that most of these were short. Um, while there were still these calls for like markets have to come further down, we have like yeah. still more monetary tightening, blah, blah, blah. Um, and at this point in time, like April 2023, there were so many signals um, out there that confirmed this, that high cash levels, low like futures, um, like margin loan balances. And like, there are so many signals out there. I, I wrote, um, I, in, April, in April, I wrote an article when short squeeze. And then in June, it happened basically, right? So, um, and, and then it has, now it has increased again. So basically with the option and futures traders, it seems like there's some optimism returning here. Right? Mm -hmm. It seems at least like, it's actually remarkable how quickly this moves up. Yeah. And so my interpretation of the current situation is, this is a new bull market. Um, the first phase of the bull market was short covering. Right. And we have completed that. Okay. And now for a continuation of this bull market, we will need actual fundamentally motivated buying, right? So that there isn't much anymore that we can get from simply squeezing the shorts that has happened. So we need optimism. Um, we need further disinflation with economic resilience, with robust labor markets that will then yeah, bring monetary policy back to normal levels. And, and, and that will make optimism return. Maybe the whole AI theme will pick up and, and then corporate investing picks up. The corporate earnings need to be resilient, all of these things. So we, we need like we need um, optimistic buying like of some of people really they want exposure and, and that needs to happen i'm optimistic that it will happen uh -huh. but obviously there are more downside risks now than there have been in like let's say six months ago and that's okay if a bull market uh, progresses downside risks increase along the way we cannot always have this crazy like no-brainer setup that we had um but for now this is not yet a warning signal for me like you can see here for example um when this goes into positive territory, it stays there for a while, right? Yeah, this is like yeah. a, a healthy bull market or here. Um, so it can remain positive. It's not a warning signal. Um, it has to, but it has to be viewed in conjunction with other um, indicators. Right, right. All right. And so now uh, that brings us all back to the specific thing that you talk about, though, is commitment. How is that still? Uh, is there is there more to the story in terms of commitment or the commitment index or is or is that what you just explained and how does the word commitment fit into what you've been talking about yeah commitment is in a future you're committed to buy or you're committed to sell okay right and, and that's where the term comes from like here we have like um 400 000 contracts of e-mini futures and, and equivalents that are committed to to a long position okay. and 
just just for, for to give you some perspective on, on what that actually means. So the 800,000 contracts we had here in 2020 before the COVID crash happened. Yeah. That was the equivalent, like it was a commitment of $130 billion in the option chain or in the futures and option yeah. Uh, yeah. chain. Yeah. And then that moved down within three months to like here minus 200, 200 a bit more than 200,000. Yeah. So that is uh, minus 40 billion. So this was a swing of 170 billion selling pressure, wow. right? And um, the total market value of the S&P is whatever, 40 trillion. So it's a small amount, but it's not insignificant. It, right. it like price price discovery happens with much smaller amounts, right? Than than the than the entire value of the um, the market cap of everything out there. So this was the deleveraging in the derivatives market was an important contributor to this sell-off. Right, right. All right. Okay. Well, that is extremely interesting. Now, if somebody wants to see, you know, what this what this chart looks like tomorrow or have some indication of what you, you called it the commitment, uh, the, is there a commitment index? Is there somebody who puts this out weekly or, or monthly or how does that work? Yeah, so it's it's called the commitment of traders report. It's yeah. um, they publishes every Friday, um, every Friday. Okay. but it's it's a big spreadsheet basically. And then there are many providers that offer then um, services um, to um, yeah digest this information. But I don't do it every week because I don't feel it's warranted given the I swings see. that happen in there. I, I think I do like once a month. I do an update I on see. this, I see. and then I also provide the Excel workbook that you can um, play around with that yourself. Um, and it actually it has not just the S and P. It has a whole bunch of other financial futures, uh, commodities markets, fixed income, uh, volatility. The VIX, for example, um, even Bitcoin is in there. So yeah, I do that about once a month. About once a month in your yeah. newsletter, which people yeah. can get by going to your website, which is fallacyalarm.com. Alarm. Why, why do I have so much trouble with fallacy alarm? Anyway, maybe you have a branding issue. I don't maybe know. Maybe you have a branding <laughs> issue or maybe it's me. Maybe it's just age. Anyway, fallacyalarm.com is where people can go. They can get your, the newsletter is free, right? Um, yeah, it's free. Um, there's um, maybe half of the articles are free. The other half is paid because um, yeah, right. I, I think right. it's the most straightforward form of monetization that people reading it will pay for it too. So I don't have any ads. I don't sell any courses. It's just, if you if you Simple, if, you're, if you're happy if you're happy with this much information it's free and if you want the rest it's uh, there's a paywall that yeah it's, makes sense to me yeah. <laughs> a good business proposition Renee as always uh, you are bringing us you're the you're the uh, you're the Brian Wong of the financial side and <laughs> that's great for this channel so yeah. thank you so much for being on board today uh, for those of you who are regular listeners. Uh, you know what to do. Hit the like so Renee comes back. Hit subscribe and, and notify. And then uh, follow Renee everywhere he goes. So you're also, or do you do much on Twitter? Yeah, that, that's my, those are my two channels, basically. My Twitter account and the Substack. So they should also follow you at Fallacy Alarm on Twitter. Uh, yes. Well, or X, I'm sorry. X, sorry. Formerly, we'll <laughs> known, formerly known as Twitter. Okay. Yeah. Right. Thanks again, Renee. And for Thank all you, of Renee. you out there, um, it's been great talking to you. Click the link below to get your paperback, Kindle or audiobook now.